let's assume that let's say you have a daughter or a son who comes to you and tells you that i'm confused uh, i've done my engineering i've done my undergrad now i am thinking of a career in private sector versus a career in the civil services i'm tilted towards preparing for the exam of civil services but i'm still confused um, how should that person take a decision which career should he or she pursue what would be your advice say, you're talking about mayavati madam you're talking about the present there are hundreds of people with the same qualities so what is that they have that so nobody has cracked this leadership in fact i am still not able to crack it so they have something in them which is strongly rooted in values or something it's not just absolutely and for all those who may not be aware the largest smartphone factory in the world is no longer in china or south korea it is in noida these politicians will test you they will ask you to do things which... so let's delve deeper into into this component of study leaves in the civil services so you mentioned that it takes 4 years okay, so you remember when you are in the final year of engineering there is campus placements happening and all your batchmates are looking at your face oh this guy doesn't have a resume he is not even sitting in any campus we make first class policies but uh, third class implementation right so you must have heard of it so how do you you know improve the design of your policies this podcast is going to be long unfiltered and an absolute must for anyone flirting with the idea of appearing for the UPSC civil services exam to become an IAS officer not the foreign services or the police services but the IAS because in this podcast we talk about the challenges of dreaming inside the government as an IAS officer we also talk about the future prospects of the lateral entry into the civil services and we'll do a comparative analysis of training of officers in the IAS versus the trainings of officers in some of the most efficient bureaucracies namely Singapore and Denmark we will cover various other very interesting facets about the life in the IAS including the career prospects within the IAS in the form of higher education or secondments in the world bank un or even in the private sector there will be moments when you will feel like dropping off but please do not if you're struggling with time save this podcast for later but do watch it end to end because this podcast will broaden your horizon not just about the career in the IAS but also about the story of India and why you should be proud of it believe me there is no podcast on the internet today that goes on to provide such a rich perspective on career in the IAS so do bookmark it In 1947 India was one of the poorest most backward most illiterate and diseased society on earth but today India has raised literacy from 16% to more than 80% increased life expectancy from 26 to 72 years raised the rate of growth of its economy from 1% to be the world's third largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity there's a lot that's wrong within there there are politicians and civil servants who loot who steal who rob the public treasury and go away scot free and unpunished and almost every indian have heard of them but there are many unsung heroes that modern india is oblivious of these unsung heroes are those who take up the inexplicable dream of dreaming inside the government their every action or in action is scrutinized carefully by the media judiciary and even the political executives and these are the unsung officers in the indian administrative services during the east india company the civil services were classified into three categories covenanted uncovenanted and special civil services in 1858 when the british crown established its authority over india covenanted was replaced by the ics or the indian civil services the ics became the highest civil services in india between 1858 and 1947 the first exam for the indian civil services was held in london in 1855 satyendranath tagore the elder brother of rabindranath tagore became the first indian to qualify for the indian civil services in 1864 thereafter many prominent indians have cleared this exam delhi's chief minister arvind kejriwal india's external affairs minister s jay shankar and the former india's finance minister jashwant sinha in fact india's freedom fighter netaji subhash chandra bose almost became a civil servant but destiny had different plans for him and he was first of many who chose a plan b to contribute to country's growth story welcome to the season 1 of the money heist podcast in this podcast i'm absolutely delighted to introduce my dear friend navin 
for his indelible passion for the civil services, Napoleon's war strategies, and of course, filter coffee. Naveen has been part of the IAS for approximately 20 years. In his 20 years career, Naveen has led districts as a DM. He has worked as Special Secretary to the former UP Chief Minister, Mr. Akhilesh Yadav, and is currently posted as Special Secretary Health in the Government of Andhra Pradesh. Hi everyone, I'm absolutely delighted to have Naveen for a wonderful chat around the Indian Administrative Services today. Thank you so much, Naveen. I'm so glad to have you in this podcast called The Money Heist. Thank you, Nama. So Naveen, uh, so there's a person called Naseem Nicholas Talib. And uh, during my time at the Fletcher School, he was a fellow there. I had a brief interaction with him and he said one very beautiful thing about life. He said that the business of life is not about money, power, status, perks and privileges. Everything in life eventually boils down to acquisition of memories, acquisition of experiences and the kind of experiences and memories you create for others. And one profession that allows you to create large scale, large meaning experiences not just for yourself, but for people around you, is the Indian Administrative Services. It is also said that it's not a job, it's a lifestyle in itself. So in this podcast, we look forward to learning and hearing all the facets of uh, the Indian Administrative Services. Welcome to the podcast. Could you briefly tell us about your background and uh, how you got into the civil services? Uh, hi, Naman. Thanks for this. Uh, I, I think I completely agree with what you quoted of him. I, in fact, I'm also a big fan of him. Uh, one of the quotes which I also I like about him is he talks about graveyard. So that thing is uh, pretty much is into my head. Uh, I think it's, I don't know which book of his, which I, it starts with, I think, pulled by randomness, I believe. When you, when you read that, he talks about graveyard. So this service, when you talk about, we talk about 100 people coming out of the service, right? There are lakhs of graveyards which are there, right? So we don't talk about it. So that's a very strong, um, I, I know it keeps pinging me that every single time I look at that, right? So I, I always think there's an opportunity you're being given to do it because there are thousands of people who are trying to do something, get into what, where you are, and then you were not, you haven't this privilege to be there. So you should make that, you know, your ascent, a purpose, right? Purposeful journey. So I thank, I think you quoted with, you started with the right quote to begin with. I come from Chennai. I grew up in Chennai, uh, studied in Chennai. I am uh, Telugu by blood and uh, Tamil by culture. So, so I'm the proper Madrasi who loves spiritual coffee and uh, yeah, whatnot. I love Chennai to the core. So I, 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 when I go there, I just melt over the place. I don't know people don't like Chennai much, but I, for me, Chennai is everything. So that's there. And I think Chennai also has this very different cultural thing, right? So. I also believe it's a very egalitarian society. I'm talking about Chennai, not uh, I see Chennai as a different culture from rest of the things. In fact, you are, when you call an auto driver, also you say auto sir or auto uh, driver or sir or uh, driver or not. So that's uh, something which you learn. You are respectful to many people. And I think uh, self-respect, I think it also started the self-respect movement in the country. So I think uh, the respect thing is very high on in Chennai. I think uh, I don't see that in any part of the country where you are very respectful to the uh, your co-workers, colleagues, uh, with whom you don't have a purpose, right? So for, they just serve you. So that's something I like about this city. I studied engineering at uh, Madras University, right? And then after the engineering, I went to Delhi for preparation for a year and then moved to engineering services and then the uh, IAS. So I'm into my 20th year of my service now. So it's a long journey already away from Chennai. And I've been, I worked in Bombay, Kolkata and uh, Delhi. So I'm the, probably the only bureaucrat who's worked in all the four metros, lived and worked in all metros. Oh, that's amazing. And to all the viewers who are watching this, I have a request for you all. Take a guess on how old is Naveen. He is heading the, the, the Department of Health uh, in Andhra Pradesh. So definitely his health is in order. And I hope that stays the same. But I really love the fact that you're, twi- you're 20 years into the services. And you look very young. Thanks. Great. So, Naveen, what uh, inspired you to get into the civil services in the first place? From from your See, story, it seems that uh, you were very clear that you did your engineering. You did not do, do any job thereafter. I think the first job for you was the SDM. 
how did that clarity come to you and looks like like it has augured well for you but for many it may not be the case so very keen to understand how did that uh, story of civil services fits into your life yeah this is a story of a young boy i think guy was good in quizzes when i was young i think 6 or 7 standard then there was this rashtriya military college exam which happens around 7th standard 8th standard so i never knew that you need to prepare for it right so i never knew i was just doing things on my own and then i gave this exam and failed actually and probably the last, the first national exam i gave and failed so that was also a big lesson and what i learned is then my father told me there are ways to serve the country right i always wanted to serve the country it's the purpose it's not the how do you get in right so then he told me ias is also a good choice so it didn't strike that much then and there was this occasion where i met a district collector i uh, this name is dr varupa sadrao he happens to be a uh, MLA Gurur now and he was also a member of parliament from Tirupati he is 1983 batch from Tamil Nadu so he, there was some huts near my place which got burned due to a freak fire accident and this guy traveled 40 kilometers from his headquarters station to come and give rice bags and other relief material yeah. so this impressed me so i have a photo with him in fact the photo is still with him and that was always the inspiration so one day i'll be a collector serving people i think the journey started somewhere when i was 8th standard I think somehow I, I I remember when I got my admission to the engineering. Also, my the reason I took engineering is that you need to have something like a backup, right? For, you do four years engineering, even if something goes wrong, you have an engineering job at least. So I remember my father coming out of uh, that was the counselling uh, when I got a government seat. So out when we came out of the counselling, my father was very clear: this is just a backup yeah. <laughs> to prepare for services. So it's a combined trip of my parents and mine. I think we could uh, both. agree upon or maybe that's the thing which kept on uh, making me move forward and uh, yeah so there are games of this uh, preparation i wanted to give exams in psychology and economics and i was good in economics but there are rules so you need to many people fail i think that's the uh, thing you need to change the rules your own strategy to the rules of the game so when you do that i think you will prefer so the first lesson i learned is that i should go get away with that option called economics and try and do an option called sociology it was also useful for me because i could understand many many things which are related to the societal uh, the workings the environment stuff like that but the first lesson is that i was flexible that's the first lesson which i learned you need to you know change your strategy when you start preparing for services so yeah that's how i got him so you need okay. to be adaptive so learn the rules okay so we will not talk about your strategy for civil services in the entire podcast because uh, there is plethora of information around that already the goal would be to touch various facets of life in the civil services so you briefly mentioned that uh, you had the opportunity a very unique opportunity to work across metros in india as per my understanding i think the ias is a cardo based services and uh, you are allocated a cardo so i stalked your linkedin profile briefly and i realized that you were in up cardo for some time and now you are working in nap So how is yes. that transition possible? And um, because my assumption until now was that you are given a cadre for life, for life. That's where you're going to work. You can take central deputations, but uh, interstate cadre transfers may not be a possibility. Off to you. So let me make uh, clarify this part. So I was in engineering services before I got into IAS, the central government services, where I was working okay. for intellectual property office. So all the intellectual property office are there in the four metros of this country. and then i joined civil services in 2007 so that's the time i joined so i'm i'm born to where they say born b o r n e born to the up cadre but there's also a provision in the government where they let you go to an interstate deputation it's called isd where you are permitted 3 plus 2 years to go to a different cadre so i'm about to complete my third year in uh, ap and ap being my uh, mother state in fact my mother state so i could uh, convince them to post me for that So what happens? I really like this part. The, me coming to AP. See, imagine I'm working in AP, UP, AP. So you get to see the country. In fact, one of the jobs which I love the most is the observership, which the election commission posts me. So you get to see the country. I, I when I was posted in Jharkhand, I came to know of a language, uh, of a script called Om Om something. Okay, I am not able to recollect the name. It's one of the 22 languages which we have in the yeah. national schedules. Not many of us know us know it. It's a it's the script which they use to write Santali. And there are languages which are we we don't even know. And Jharkhand was so beautiful. So there there are things which 
we always talk about USA going to Europe and all. There are so many things which we can learn and see in our own country, right? So that this uh, job definitely gives me a big opportunity to learn what this great country is all about. Wow. I think one thing I think we discussed in the last chat that we had was there are many fallacies and misconceptions about uh, the civil services. If we look at the services from the outside, we are of the assumption that uh, as a civil servant, it is extremely difficult to to have that market like efficiencies when you're reporting to politicians who may not, at least for the outsider, that's the belief, who may not be as educated or may have perverse incentives that you have as a bureaucrat. So what do you think about those misconceptions are those misconceptions in reality or are those right conceptions you called it already it's you called it a misconception already so it's a narrative which i think it's the narrative which we build our own you think of this uh, i studied psychology so you have a lot of prejudices to you know help yourself it's a tool or heuristic which tool which we use to you know help ourselves to understand things right imagine what this country has achieved in the last 60 70 years it's because of the politicians it's not just the bureaucrats who are put it's a combination of politicians and bureaucrats see the covid response did you believe that country like us to will respond the way we responded it was public health care which was responding so we cannot uh, and you talked about market efficiency right i think we are more or market efficient than the things look at our polio drive look at the you know stuff we have achieved we are, we don't talk about it i think there is this strong narrative i i has used this a uh, logic last time the airplane crash right we always yeah. think that when you, you think more of airplane crash than the the road accidents but we have more road accidents than the airplane crash so it's the same logic you we tr- try to use an analogy and then find that the, which fits our narrative and then talk about things i completely believe that what this country country has achieved was the collaboration with the political executive and the the great greatness of our own democracy which has achieved and given what we are today i think the covid response is one thing we can talk about n number of the education also on last conversation also talking about a yellow girl getting an mbbs seat how did this happen this is all because of the government initiatives right one step at a time many step at a time many things are happening we just don't want to see it so it is only the bad news makes the news right so it's not the good news we don't when was the last time in fact i had a, after a spoken view i was thinking of it the same uh, bureaucracy gets changed in usa but we do not we say that it's a merit change right mm-hmm. when the same bureaucracy changed when the politicians come here we say oh the politicians came and changed how the why do we have two kinds of uh, you know filters to look at it you look, look at obama when obama comes in or any Uh, uh the the rishi sunak comes in he immediately changes his bureaucracy right but we do not point fingers at that right but when it comes to india when there's a chief minister who takes over prime minister who takes over the bureaucracy change then they talk about why the bureaucracy is changed so there is there are bureaucracy is still the same only their portfolios are changed they don't they never throw them out right so that is there so you go there do your part there are maybe you are not in road and uh, building development but you are doing healthcare a new change so you are contributing to the society as a government so it's, it's the narrative i think it has to change but i would not completely say it's a misconception there is a bit of uh, what is there but i strongly believe uh, what i see in the long run is democracy always wins mm-hmm. and what we have in this country is this many interest groups i think it's the interest groups which makes a lot of sense i think the the purpose of the interest group or the the narratives they want and then the the results they want in fact outcomes they want and that's what you see 60 years it's not just one interest group which benefited somebody benefits then the other one comes the other benefits so the way you see changes on the long run so i'm a strong believer in democracy which i was not when i was young we always used to be very cynical about that but i think that's a beautiful thing which kept this country together and got many aspirations going absolutely so when i when i was talking about market like efficiencies in context to bureaucracy i was quoting another ias officer called shrivat sakrishna when he said that uh, there are many challenges of framing inside the government and it is a herculean task to have those uh, market like results when you're reporting to pappu yadav or lalu yadav in that context and basis your experiences for 20 years in the government did you face any challenges of framing inside the government were you able to achieve whatever you intended to for the benefit of the people when you were working as the dm or in various other positions i don't know whether i could call myself lucky or not but i think i got my way 
there's a struggle i think there's a struggle there you need to know see the intelligent person is one who adapts himself or herself to the ways and means of the, i called it first thing which i did when i get into the rules of the game so i learned the rules of the game quickly get my intention clear so i think i had a very good uh, collector trainer also so what he told me is there are five, they have their interest is minimum right like 5% 10% you take care of it but you have the scope of doing that 95% of the job for which the nobody interferes that's is that is what is government is you have 95% of your job given to you where nobody interferes with what you want to do. so why can't i use that knife why do i worry about that 5% part which would make me struggle so you talked about uh, the policies right can you believe you uttar pradesh had the first electronic manufacturing policy the largest one and also the startup policy in summer in yeah. 2014 2015 okay so and that's why noida is hub of uh, electronic i was talking about this particular phone which i carry i went and handed over the land where this phone is manufactured right so that's a story we have so up states people do not believe when we we had put a stall in text parks in 2060 saying that up has a startup policy they could not believe that up has a startup policy comprehensive startup policy which was for the startup entrepreneur the incubators also the fund of funds so things happen it's just the vision you need to see you have your game clear i i completely believe that you have your game clear you have 90% 95% chances of doing what you want to do you start tripping about the 5% part you don't do that so i remember i uh, recently i was talking to dr nori dattray priya so he he asked me the same question what you are trying to ask me are you ever depressed that things what you wanted to do did you it, you did not make it up i said sir sometimes so he told me navin you should be ready for 30% cut so when we wanted we wanted to put 43 uh, cancer centers across ap yeah and there was only one cancer center in ap now we are able to get 28 cancer centers in ap so this this would be the largest state with 28 cancer centers within 50 km radius these are beautiful things which could happen plan b you might not reach there but you will come somewhere near to it and i think i i i use this word extremely like in fact napoleon also talks about winning war it's not just strategy not about soldier you need to have lucky generals also so yeah. it's that it happens absolutely and for all those who uh, may not be aware the largest smartphone factory in the world is no longer in china or south korea it is in noida so and a remarkable feat for india and there are many such such achievements that india has achieved and all thanks to the the wonderful work that the bureaucrats have done and one story that that i think we discussed last time as well was the story of hyderabad on how the the microsoft's only offshore development center outside of redmond seattle is now located in hyderabad and the second one that's coming up is going to be noida and this has been all because of the the great collaboration and work and foresight of a few civil servants along with the political leadership of uh, that specific state so very rightly said navin uh, you also use the term called rule book you learn certain rules early in the in the career what what are the components of the rule book well, there is a specific component for uh, uh, rule book i say adaptability and intelligent right that is very important and you also have to be empathetic when you understand the cause of uh, the purpose See, these politicians will test you they will ask you to do things which you want but they once they know your purpose i think i i think we never we miss this talk on purpose right so that purpose is very important they know what you are clearly so there is this thing you quoted about a senior politician there is also a quote about he knows who whom with whom we should use up g and uh, to so there is a very famous quote about him so they know who you are right so they assess you they bend you only when you are bendable it's what that they will bend you when you are not bendable so and uh, it makes sense when you have strong sense of purpose right i don't think uh, these are issues when you come to growth i'm i'm sounding very maybe i'm sounding naive after 20 years of service but i strongly believe that's how it has been for me i have pushed through things got it done i i think that's the maybe it's a classical example of go getter or something but i would always say that I think people can do it and there are people who are achieving it. it's not just me you go about reading better india there are officers who have taken the might and got through with things and they are delivering and there are also silent warriors the, the 95% job which i am talking about there are officers who are not all doing that pr stuff but simply doing what it takes to take this country forward i i know the officers wouldn't have heard of there was an officer in tamil nadu who was silently changing the education system in sign and tamil nadu there are officers who are silently doing things you i know an officer amod kumar who, who silently brought that lokwani system getting services for each of the 
can you believe a caste certificate can be issued at your you know at your doorstep or at your village using a lokwani kendra which is the now it is called common service center it was his idea so there are other so these are ideas which are all come from offices in fact we spoke about hyderabad i i think i should mention they are also one of my inspiration uh, dr j satyanarayan sir and redithala chandrashekar sir every single time i see them i remember i am there i have done 8 9 years in it it's just because of them because these guys single handedly brought digital into government and made sure that any every citizen benefits out of it so i also i'm also one of those a techo technocrat or what uh, so i always make sure that what how can technology can help people i see a lot of uh, difference even in healthcare we can digital uh, technology could be the last mile enabler so there are things which we can do if we should forget about the creeping part just see what you can do where you are so start doing it absolutely so let's change gears and let's talk about the work that you have done in past 20 years so in terms of experiences in terms of your contribution if you were to pick five achievements that you are extremely proud of yourself may not have been covered in the pr and and to be honest no one cares about that but it's eventually it all boils down to what you feel inside so according to you what are the five things that uh, made your decision to join civil services really worthy and that you are extremely proud of i okay i will start my journey in fact i was posted in gorakhpur i finish my uh, training in kanpur and then go to academy and then start coming So when I landed in Gorakhpur, I clearly image remember this image. There was the train is going, and the both the sides of the train there was only water. Was Gorakhpur was flooded when I landed in Gorakhpur, and that flood side comes somewhere in August of 2009. So I remember I used to have uh, I used to be afraid of water. I never uh, go in boats that easily. So suddenly my orderly says, "Sir, you have to go and see the drowned village, right? So you just get." So I remove all my chain, watch, wallet, everything, and give it to him. So thinking that I will not come back alive, right? So I sat in a small round boat which goes inside the village. So that is how I learned. See, uh, floods. I think flood management, which we did in Gorakhpur, twice I saw two floods in Gorakhpur. One flood in Banda, which is something which has never happened. So I'm extremely proud of it. Water conservation. We did about three thousand uh, ponds water works in uh, Alabad. Remember, we have two great rivers in. Uh, Allahabad, one is Ganga, the other is Jamuna, but the city between that is doesn't have water. So that's the tragedy. So I think water. I think we were also. I was also waterman in Allahabad. I we did a lot of work in Bundel when when I was posted with the CM's office, digging up a lot of lakes in Bundel and hundred big lakes were dug up that time. I think that would be my second best. The fourth is that the establishment of medical supply corporation. Mm-hmm. the supplies you must have heard of this got a poor tragedy and all and then where the supplies were not oxygen supply was not able to have, uh, was not in line so i was posted as an officer to set up this corporation to streamline all procurement in the government in the medical supplies and uh, we could easily establish i think that's the thing which always stands out in my resume you could establish corporation within 4 months recruit people buy medicines and supply it at a scale of up imagine i don't think it, i always call it it's the largest medical supply corporation in the world uh, as 2500 crores it's a business operation right only medicines so that is there and here in uh, andhra pradesh i was able to set up the grama water sachivalaya which is the largest public service delivery department with 1 and 1/2 lakh employees and 2 and 1/2 lakh uh, volunteers so uh, probably the largest single department in the country where you are coordinating with multiple departments so the the present chief minister of andhra pradesh he was of this vision that the services should be available at the village so 10 officers village level officers would be available at the village to give you services for in uh, revenue panchayat health and what not survey all services agriculture all the services would be available at that particular village level for every 2000 people so that's the biggest revolution which is. so we in fact we talked about the changes which you are bringing this is one of the biggest revolutionary change which has happened so these are things which are plantation drive i did i love plantation drive so we did about 5 crores plantation in up i think now the up is always doing a lot of plantation even in andhra we did 1 crore plantation drive in the last uh, monsoon season was uh, commissioner ardi so uh, one of the things which i see is you are you know your uh, uh, officer ias officer by design i called it by design not by uh, the ownership or something you are made to do multiple things and if you are quick to uh, learn things and a lot of learning and unlearning also happens because 
uh, when I was doing electronic procurement, it had a different strategy. When you was buying a medical procurement, it had a different strategy, which means that you have to, you have to quickly unlearn. Also, you asked about what are the games of the rule book. It's one of those most important things: learning, unlearning, and relearning. Yeah. Every single job, it's not just you come with a great hand, middle stash, you touch things will fall in place. Sometimes you have to start from the scratch, and it will be your thing. So you are an officer with a reputation with 14 years of service, 13 years of service. You go there. It looks like you are actually as a professional, first day of the job, learning things, putting knots together, finding ways to your, you know, ways in your thing. So it's not just. I think it will be the same for the next 10, 20 years of my service again. So it's going to be tough, but I'll, I'm prepared to learn. So we, I would, I think that's the only way to, you know, survive or in the go succeed. In fact, I won't survive. I'm not a survivor, so I'm a succeed. So I'll succeed. Absolutely, and. since we talked about uh, we began with nasim talib and uh, i think his opinions on civil servants and and economists are very popular he do not hold them at very high esteem could be for various reasons uh, but one of the reasons is that they do not have usually the skin in the game it's the perverse incentive structure that that is there do you think even in the indian civil services the the incentive structure is not well un- aligned for civil servants there are examples when even if you were to not do anything you will be promoted on time based scale and if you were to really work really hard and when you work hard you make mistakes and when you make mistakes judiciary to um, the media will scrutinize you for all your deeds so don't you think the entire structure is designed in a way that does not promote work it in a way empowers those who play safe who don't do anything and wait until they get promoted Yeah, so I think this debate has been happening for a long time, right? So I think there's this feeling within the community saying, uh, thinking that I think once you are in this community that you accept the rules of the game. This is what it is, and you start working within the rules of the game. So I don't think there is much of a difference. But what you talked about incentives to work, right? So you, they don't pick a bad officer to run a successful department. They'll always pick whoever it is. They'll always pick the best officer because it's not just. sometimes it's the officer who's holding the department together right so getting things done uh, say it's be it agriculture be it health or be it road and development you need to show results it's not any more a, a place where you can actually be sitting idle and then things will fall in place and it starts from imagine if there was an health secretary who was was not a good officer what would have happened in the covid management the entire country would have cried right so it's not just you, you can get away with things there is this again the narrative problem i think there is this narrative that officers would not do much but i think given an opportunity wherever they say i'm trying to be very uh, because i uh, affirmative it's not or not uh, assertive but i'm trying to be affirmative saying that there are given the opportunity officers would perform i think that is there always so i all explain that you are 95% chances of doing your own stuff so do that 95% makes makes a lot of sense and uh... and is it uh, across civil services this scenario or is it just prevalent to the ias so if you were to compare the job profile of an ias versus ips versus ifs versus other allied services there's a obviously there's a lot of craze to become an ias officer so what are the perks privileges opportunities uh, that people from other services get versus the ias see uh, there is always this debate which is better service ias ips or the ifs right so it depends on the personality of the person also so i been i am learner so i like things to learn so i when i said it also this profession only the ias thing gives you a lot of opportunity wide range of opportunity when i i remember when i was giving this answer as an upsc aspirant it didn't make this sense what i'm able to tell you today imagine i in gorakhpur i was a pds man i was raiding pds shops in alabad i was doing water you know conservation projects and in the um, i was it digital it secretary i was doing uh, you know services where the services would go to the people uh, in um, or well, medical supply corporation was procuring medicines which jobs gives you this kind of wide range of i don't even think a ceo of a google would get this kind of opportunity to do so many things right so so these are things you should learn and why it is that i'm using this word again it's not just i picked it today i am in mental health tomorrow i can be road by this thing i have to learn how a sro works how a civil engineer managers so in fact i remember somebody asked me to I was trying to show me education stuff, so I was telling him I have zero knowledge of education. The only thing I know is that people go to school and come back. But there are mechanization which works. There is an infrastructure. There is this strategy for you know improving education, which I would not know. But maybe if I'm made an education secretary, I would pick it. 
I there are a lot of people from the Indian Police Service and the Indian Revenue Service coming into the uh, jobs of the uh, primarily reserved for the IAS, but they are also picking their you know uh, strings and getting things together. I think that's the opportunity, and I personally love being a foreign service officer. I always thought that I will also be a good successful foreign service officer. and they also do predominantly good work you know you know pulling out cooperation talking about the country i think the 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 very reason the country is doing high in the uh, international scene i think i would call this this word scene it's because of this foreign service officer so everybody has a role to play i always believe civil service is not just ias ips and irs even the, the teacher going to school the doctor coming to the hospital and every Absolutely. single sweeper i think i think the sweeper on the road he is also a civil servant in a way because he is serving the public service right so we are the ones who are keeping this country together it's not just the people who are uh, you know the designated or the big big squad serving the country it's every single person i in fact i remember sometimes even the chai wala is doing the service imagine five o'clock if you don't open your shop you don't get a chai there are vendors who want a chai because they can't do it and you also say imagine we forget the chai wala business i am talking about imagine the same chai is prepared at home that the time lost the money lost he is actually serving a society in a way because he is really reducing the cost of transaction in terms of time and money right so these are beautiful things the how the country is growing he could open a shop at 7 o'clock 8 o'clock why does he open a shop at 5 o'clock he knows there are five people who would want chai but he put that is the kind of uh, people we need in this country who who serve every single day we need to see them there are auto drivers who would be there on the road knowing that there will be lady going alone so we should be you know try, you know safely Not take her from place one to be government buses. I I'm very proud of this. There will be a government bus for you at twelve o'clock, flying only flying only one passenger. Mm-hmm. That is government for you. That's a government bus, right? So that's government. I think we do too many beautiful things on a, every single day. We just don't see it. Absolutely, and I really like that point where you mentioned that uh, as an IAS officer. you get exposure to various disciplines one day you are a health secretary to education secretary to a dm so on and so forth and kind of exposure that you get may not be i mean i may disagree but it could be different from what sundar which i would be getting let's say in alphabet but uh, but don't you think it's also a point where the ias is criticized because it's not a specialized service what are the benefits that you get when you are leading an education department and you do not come with those sort of expertise for a health department and you're not a doctor especially in the ifs at least diplomats have trained in that same discipline for years they've worked in that same discipline and then they're leading the ministries but same is the case with the irs officer or the auditors but for ias you are doing so many things not specializing in any of those things so that's the criticism that the, the external audience half for the ias what are your thoughts on this it's a very easy answer there are books which will talk about there is a nice book called range uh, published by epstein so let me forget ias for a moment go at un jobs who is leading un jobs whether, whether it is specialist or someone look at uh, companies like microsoft or google in fact if you look at microsoft you are given exposure in many things you you don't become only a finance guy heading at microsoft you are also you know pushed into business development you are also pushed into market you are also pushed into many things when you actually want to become as a ceo i think that's a thing which microsoft does so what we talk about is it's a t curve which you think of like when you are generalized and then go to a norm doing a certain specialization if you look at every single officer they will have a certain expertise for me it's an it there are officers who are experts in healthcare and then there are officers who are very good in road administration urban management so there are officers who pick this specialization that's why they continue in fact if you look at radha krishna sir he has been 7 8 years in health department in tamil nadu so whenever there is a crisis they'll bring him back to health department but again the opportunity to so what you talked about diplomats are doing diplomacy as a skill what is my skill it's administration sir so it is it's not just uh, i when i think we spoke about this it's the hr management which i called administrative mode. the only skill set i is to bring a lot of people call the ideas and make things work so that is something which i call as the core skill of an ias officer the administrative skill which we try to miss it's not the specialist you can read this book called range which talks about specialist will go to a level how can where till when you can you see if i become the ceo so that's the question i think there have been cfos who have been successful ceos also in fact the uh, when you talk about ibm 
the louis gaston I'm, i'm too fond of him he was a ceo he is a finance guy who ran ceo so there are people who come with a different mindset but they also see numbers on a different platter and then see make changes to happen so that's what we do day in day out it's not just the skill which we have is administrative skill to learn things what i spoke is that it's not what diplomats learn it's the same thing you do negotiations you t- know trade agreements it's the same thing which we do day and out we know a certain policy okay I'll, let me put it when if you are a collector you know the entire you know the entire platform the entire ecosystem of how a district look like but if you make only one doctor to run a scheme for anemia he would only think that okay doctors only will go and do the you know give that folic acid or anm will give folic acid it won't work like that there are behavioral changes maybe you have to use anganwadi system you need to you know educate the education system the only person who could come come with this kind of competence is an administrative officer i'm not trying to tell that they are the only ones but why is that administrative officers are not replaced very that is a case all the ias officers would have been replaced by specialists there was also this attempt by to bring in specialists but did that succeed and there are countries you i think i'm also told that in health, in us there is something of health czar yes we need to work with specialists learn from them how did i set up corporation i remember I'll, i'll put this thing example to you we need to finalize the essential drug list so we called all the doctors in the state who are leading doctors and asked them to sit in a room around 60 70 doctors were there we asked them to tell them what are the medicines you need for the public health care the primary health care the community health care and also the tertiary health care within an hour or so there was debates going this medicine should come this medicine should come this should not come and some who will be the one who can decide on it the person who is neutral who could understand okay how many say what is the question i would ask as an administrator how many people would come with this particular disease so what is the quantum of medicine would you need these are the questions which doctor might not think but as an administrator i would know this question what is the quantum of paracetamol i would need for the state of you know up and that's a question the administrator because they would not be able to because these are the questions which an officer could come out with i think you cannot i do not believe that you can delegate the administrative service as a non special but you learn doing things in the kind of wisdom i think that's the word i would want to bring in the wisdom you have in doing things would transfer and transform the stuff you will do again in i told you also i was doing uh, electronic procurement it was a different ball game but i was trying to do medical procurement i had some elements of my learning as a procurer because there was also this thing i was running a corporation i knew exactly how to run a corporation so when i was able to set up this uh, the new corporation was only on paper so i had to set up this new corporation so i had elements of my own learning that the corporation would have a director finance there is a strong uh, you know um, uh, chartered accountancy system you have to build for you know tracking them this these are things which i picked from there and brought in here but here i picked and game how how many medicines should i buy how what is the medicine look like how do you make specification so there are things you learn and do it wow oh, and so for example like you mentioned that you your expertise lies in the it so whenever you are given posting so whenever you are given the option to do a posting i'm not sure if you're given any uh do you have any say that uh, i'm very excited to bring a large scale work in let's say it and do you have any yes. any luxury of freedom to choose and decide if you can work in that space yes i think sometimes uh, when you are a senior officer they start calling you and asking you what are the options in fact this particular job i am landed up was asked so i remember when this particular posting was given to me i was also given uh, exclusive charge of you know digital health implementation so where i was given this so that is how the journey of uh, the andhra pradesh now right now it is a leader in healthcare with 35 million health ids i don't think any other state has done this quickly and we have about 10 million health records so this is some an opportunity because why did they pick me because they know this guy has done something in it for a long time so he would be the right guy to you know bring this health uh, digital health on uh, for ap so that's something which they look at it's not just the officers are picked without and they talk about it they openly talk about this guy has this skill this guy has skill of smartly handling people so this guy can you know handle so that job is a very political job so they'll think okay this guy has that knack of keeping everybody calm and getting things done so they talk about it. it's not just you are simply uh, there is a arrow mark your there is a name there and there is a department there is simply drag an arrow it's just it's simply it's, they talk about it there is a lot of the word i use is vivegam so it is used before you are posted there it's not just they simply blindly you uh, you know not like lottery stream pick and throw there so i think that's the narrative which we have to change
So, uh, what are your thoughts on lateral entry into the civil services? So, a few months ago, I, as a part of a consulting assignment, I was working with the Prime Minister of Serbia, Albania, and North Macedonia, and we were trying to improve their bureaucratic efficiencies. And we realized that it's let's start with benchmarking some of the great great stalwarts in this space. We looked at Denmark, Singapore, and we realized that these countries are are infusing a lot of external talent. and are realizing the value of their external talent into their bureaucracy so in context to india do you see any merit of lateral entry into the civil services and what can be the demerit of a lateral entrant in the civil services i strongly support lateral entry everywhere not just to the civil services even every system has to have a lateral entry system it's because it strengthens the system in a way because what does the civil service it's a diversity you bring in right I'm an history graduate. I'm an commerce graduate. I'm an engineering graduate. I'm an MBBS graduate. We all become the civil services. The only thing which I think would be the stepping, what uh, the bridging, uh, the way you come from the private thing, and suddenly you start adjusting to a very strong system. It's the uh, steel frame, right? So it's very strong. It has been standing there for a long time. So how do you stand there, and make your move? So I think some kind of you know bridging arrangement has to be made. I think. i think it's important that we need to get you talked about say okay if tomorrow morning i'm made as a civil aviation secretary i would not know anything so the lateral entries are now there is also consultants lot of consultants who come in fact i work with a lot of consultants in fact when i started working in it way back in 2013 i was working with consultants i would not know many things i need to get this knowledge and these are the guys who know they are the knowledge specialist again my administrative part is to work with this knowledge specialist get them to you know tell how things to be but i would also have that core competence of getting things done bringing them together getting things done i also become a guy who connects the government with the knowledge specialist so so it was able, we were able to do it i strongly believe that that's a way forward you need to have strong lateral entry system in fact i also would advise that we should also have a very strong you know A system where the officer should go and learn from outside. In fact, we all give an option. I think you were asking me in the last. I want to. Uh, I will. I will take, take that as separate component of the convents. It's it's important yeah. for many many young bureaucrats. So yeah, go on. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. So I've ordered to make it a separate person. So I'll wait for it. So let's let's do a, a detailed discussion on the convents. So we all know that many many trade organizations have this option where, so, so for example, McKinsey sends people to or BCG sends people to World Economic Forum, the UN. and these youngsters can come back and contribute to the growth story of mckinsey and bcg mckinsey also sends people to take up uh, studies at at hbs stanford and after their studies they come back and contribute to mckinsey's growth is such system prevalent in the indian indian civil services and what are the options and opportunities and when do these young civil servants become eligible to take take uh, make the best use of these opportunities okay so after 4 years of your service you are entitled for a weeks program in national institutes for example i did my training in auditing i did my training in social work at tis and these are opportunities for every single block year which they talk about a block year they give you get in one week training which i have availed all the time the second opportunity is to go abroad and study for which is called study leave they give you 2 to 3 years to go abroad and study that's the second opportunity the third opportunity is also you can work for international organizations like un who and uh, bill gates foundation in fact i know an officer who is working for the uptus us it's part of the bill gates uh, mou with the up state government yes the opportunities are very limited in fact when you talked about the last question i wanted to push this agenda when you talk about lateral entry coming into the system we should also encourage our people to go and work there and i think the reason we are i think you know, we are the reason we are not open to this idea is that there is a shortage of services or officers so we we have that uh, you know feel that when the service go sir officers go out, who will the baby the one who will be serving in fact you must be hearing this thing there is a huge shortage of officers in the central government so i think we never planned for the uh, jobs which we are supposed to fill in and there is this reluctance to send officers out i think the opportunity i think the the same if you talk about reforms of bringing in the lateral entry the reforms also to be, should be there that for the, there should be enough opportunity for an officer to go out for 5 years 10 years to learn a lot of things and come back so i think that should be there it's a two way system which should we should encourage absolutely so let's delve deeper into into this component of study leaves 
in the civil services so you mentioned that it takes 4 years for after 4 years you will be eligible to participate in the study leave opportunity no it's 9 years i think for the study leave the longer study leave 4 mm-hmm. years is the one for the one week program after 4 years of service you can start getting into one week program which is there every block year so in the in your entire career you can do about 20 30 courses of one week and then uh, you can also do about uh, yeah ma or uh, msc if you are uh, if you're not completed one there are people who have done phd from cornell i have my own uh, batchmate was done msc from london school now he's doing phd in iit delhi so there are people who are doing it great so i i sit on the dean's board at, at the fletcher school of law and diplomacy so i'm aware that fletcher has uh, forged this collaboration with the mea where uh, many diplomats i think 10 to 11 years of of experience they come there for a, for a weeks immersion program at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, so are similar opportunities available for the IAS officers as well? Yes, uh, the Harvard Kennedy School has two quota uh, for IAS every year, I'm told. So two officers are picked every year. So I think there's been a lot of officers who go abroad. In fact, Oxford has a program now, Shemling has a program, three months program. And also Korean, I think Korean and the uh, the Singapore School has started. So there are plenty of opportunities that are coming. I think it's also cross learning for this universities because i think uh, yesterday somebody was telling me how our harvard program comes the professor ask guy and come uh, you know tell his own experience from that particular experience they will teach so it's cross learning helps the other country so going to places like harvard would help us and it also would help harvard it's not just and it's a diversity i, I strongly believe in diversity it's not just uh, they also learn we also learn so that's the way it goes great and so this is study leave aspect if you also spoke briefly about the jobs that uh, you can take deputations in international organizations and multilateral organizations not sure if if you can do that in private companies because there will be a lot of uh, legal concerns there but uh, so what what does this look like these governments in terms of jobs i think there's a plenty of opportunities even in the international organizations so only thing is the governments have to be flexible in giving uh, the so called uh, noc to officers to go abroad and you know do this jobs i think many you know united nation organization would love to pick our officers with such experience and the other constraint would be family constraints also it's not just i'm talking about one part of it there are you have a strong my family is rooted there so how do you you know shift your family it's also one of the concerns i think we missed that part when we were talking about uh, yeah the, the shifting I think it's also that is also an important thing. There are officers who don't leave the headquarters only. They don't want to leave a state capital. They want to be there only because it's because of the family. It's so that is also it's it's part of our society. You have your aging parents. You have your growing children. So you need to be in the same city with them to grow up. So that is also a concern. It's not concern. It's also a point. Of course, not a concern. Yeah. So since you're talking about family, do you have um, no. wife and kids? No, single. No? Okay, yeah. so you must use you're the most eligible bachelor, perhaps in India. Let's assume that let's say you have a do- daughter or a son who comes to you and tells you that I'm confused. Uh, I've done my engineering, I've done my undergrad. Now I am thinking of a career in private sector versus a career in the civil services. I'm t- I'm tilted towards preparing for the exam of civil services, but I'm still confused. Um, how should that person take a decision? Which career? should he or she pursue what would be your advice say it's civil services i have no qualms about saying civil services i still do that to the children or kids whom i meet i have nieces and nephews i keep telling them the the reason i strongly believe is that you need to have the best of brains in our system we cannot let them to go away from the system just because you have better opportunities outside and second is a purpose i think every single night i go back to my sleep i sleep happily because i could serve people that sense of purpose this job is the one which will give you that strong sense of purpose i don't think any other job has the same strong sense of purpose i'm very happy that i'm civil servant you ask me in the middle of night you ask me 10 years from now i'll still say that civil service is the best i would i when you talked about it i didn't even have a resume when i passed out of college so you remember when you are in the final year of engineering there is campus placements happening and all your batchmates are looking at your face oh this guy doesn't have a resume he is not even sitting in any campus i was very strong my college was the largest exporter of uh, engineers to usa and also campus in fact in fact i'm also a 2002 passer the guy who passed out immediately after the, the 2001 september 11 right so 
9/11 so i did a resume i did i was sat in campus i was very happy that i was i would go to school services and i did join as a school server well and i could be wrong but my sense is that uh, at least in the past 20 years of your service you would have trained across academies you would have been to the civil services college in singapore you would have done some training in labasna uh, so in terms of if you were to do a comparison between the kind of training that that civil servants in let's say singapore and denmark do versus the the folks who do in india what's the difference why is that the case that certain countries are performing incredibly well in various metrics and these are very objectified met- metrics by metrics various by- governments and but same is not the case with india why does that happen and what all improvements can be can be undertaken by let's say dopt in in ensuring that uh, the indian civil servants also follow through on what the singapore and denmark folks are doing yeah so i i think you're right on that point right to evidence based policy making has not picked up in this country but slowly it is picking up so when you when you i see my own career way back in uh, 2007 when i started as a ias officer that is 15 years from now so then it was not the same metric system or you know measure what matters system which we had but slowly it is coming there it's now i i remember when we show presentation on the screen we show only the numbers these are the numbers in covid management how did we successfully do covid management these are numbers you were tracking mortality numbers you were tracking patients who were not you were sick so numbers i think it's the i also see that we are you know, we are in a hurry to you know do things but we are not in a hurry to publish the stuff which we do so i think the other countries have more time to do it in, and and i think we also need a strong set up in labasna or in the state academies who can you know you know you can bring these stories comprehensively and publish i think that disconnect is there the research part of the civil service is missing so what you see is i think you you think i'm very too aligned to a civil service argument but the point i'm trying to make is the publishing of our success story is only a pr driven in a way that it is an semi cooked story or a not even semi cooked it's not even gone to the semi cooked it's a badly cooked story which we tell people but there are a lot of things which have happened on numbers on metrics every single time and then we are we are not telling these stories i think it's time to bring these stories in the in the mainstream and tell that what indian civil servants have been doing so far yeah that makes a lot of sense and uh, and now you are the ideal person to, to speak um, of this because you have had good experience across districts across various states and uh, also in the central government so if you were to compare the the life in a district of up versus district of ap what's the difference number one there so let's do a district state wise comparison because you are now in this unique position of having experienced both the states yeah district in up and district in ap are different because it's this is a hometown right so i'll feel homely here so i can't compare it's only oranges with oranges and apples with apples so it's not uh, it's not incomparable but i always see that uh, i loved my posting in up also because when you are in up that um, I I think uh, talked about it uh, why would uh, I like my job in UP or when I was a collector I was very proud that the every single citizen or every person in the uh, district would know that the justice would be done if he goes to the district collector that would give me a lot strong sense of you know purpose I think that's the word I would use the strong purpose, uh, sense of purpose the last man in the district would know that if there is an uh, if he needs something or she needs something she can always go to the district magistrate or the district collector office to get it done so there are times i think i was also mentioning last time there are times where this guys would come to me and show me a paper sir aap kuch likh do usme that's the sense of hope you have in that district so i would see myself my own career personal career in a ups better than i could do uh, because i was very young then uh, more uh, naive or what you call more compassionate to do things i could do things <laughs> yeah i would not compare district to district but there are issues which you there are similar you know peculiar to up there are issues peculiar to ap it's not that bad okay i'm trying to tell you that's also important it's not that bad but slowly the country is getting you know i think uh, slowly is get country is getting to you know rationalizing this regional differences and we are there it's not it might not oh, happen overnight but the only point i want to mention here is we are progressing towards that end it's we are not going backwards that's my only uh, point i want to make here beautifully said and um, so when 
someone starts preparing for the IAS exam, the exposure that they have of the exam is that there's some someone called the called the DM or a collector. But many people do not realize that uh, it's one of the various facets. It's just one posting that you may hold for let's say 10 years, 15 years. There is a life beyond being a collector or DM in the IAS. So what is the difference between the the postings that you will take in the state secretariat versus the postings that you take in the district as the DM or a commissioner? See, at uh, district level, you are more of an um, implementer. You are There are n number of schemes and then you are getting them on the ground. It's, you are a field officer. That's the better way to put it. When you're at the state level, you are a policy maker. You have an experience of running a district. You know what were the issues. These are issues you have seen firsthand. Your experience would come a big way. Okay, if something didn't work in the field. You know that this didn't work because of that. So you have that kind of knowledge. So how do you transform this knowledge into a wise addition in when you make the schemes? So we also talk about, you know, uh, you must have heard of this uh, popular uh, discontent. We make first class policies, but uh, third class implementation, right? So you must have heard of it. So how do you, you know, improve the design of your, you know, policies? How do you get uh, more wings and harms to the your know, policies to get them grounded on the field? So this, that is the difference between them. Essentially, when you look at IAS, it's the collector which brings that charm to people to get into it. That's the collector of the district ministry. But uh, it's also the, I think, when I talk about silent warriors, a beautifully laid out education policy would change the state forever. Forever. So, the beautifully laid health policy would change this. Uh, beautifully laid cancer policy would change Absolutely. forever, right? You have that opportunity. You have 35,000 deaths in a year in cancer. Suddenly, there are there. It is stop. I don't even want it to grow. It's not just you reduce it. Even if it stops, that's a big achievement, right? So these are things which you can do at the state level. So there are a plethora of opportunities which are there for the people to, you know, their knowledge and their running the field would help them to make better policy at the state level. So that's why you first go to the field and then come to the headquarters. Very helpful, and this is uh, brilliant. So my understanding is, and I could be wrong, that uh, in a parliamentary democracy. Policy formulation is the exclusive prerogative of uh, the elected representatives in the state assemblies or in the parliament, so on and so forth. So how does IAS officer assist in formulation of policies uh, at, a, at a state level? See, uh, okay, I'll, uh, let me explain the way I did it. So when we were doing this electronic manufacturing policy, we pulled out all the policy state policies which we had, the other states, how they did it. And then we saw how much these state policies have done, right? And then... You bring a color turn policy. It's actually the executive. When you uh, call the political executive, you are also part of it. The executive arm of the the constitution. There is executive arm. There is a judiciary arm, right? So you are the part of that executive arm. It's not just the minister. Then you bring out a policy telling, okay, these are the benefits you should give to bring the IT electronic manufacturer into the state. And you try to explain. Explain and see uh, how does uh, I, I teach this when I do this to IAM graduates. What is the necessary part of a government? Why do you need a government? There isn't limited resources. Say your state budget is 5 lakh crores. How do you, can you build 50,000 schools or can you build 500 hospitals or you build uh, 5,000 bridges or make 50,000 roads? These are the questions before you. So what does political bureaucracy do or the political executive do is they say, okay, this year we'll make 10 schools, um, just uh, maybe 1,000 schools, I'm putting small numbers, 1,000 schools. 10 hospitals, 50 bridges, and given, it, given the resources, we will be able to achieve, to take care of all the interest groups. I was talking about the interest groups, right? So these are the, some interest groups, there is a bridge which didn't happen. So the people have to take a 60 kilometer drive to, you know, go to the other village. So this bridge would shorten the time. Making the road will enable more students to go to school. So these are questions which are already there. Limited constraints if i if i have all the money which i need then i can make everything but there are there is a limitation of i think uh, probably the money which is there in fact there's also this complaint i will come with in this question saying that how why money is not fruitfully used to that my point is i'm not going to that question but there is a limited constraint of resources how effectively you can use this limited constraint i would want for 34000 patients or 50 60000 patients who are going to cancer treatment immediately i want 60 line acts each line would cost about 20 crores, which means that you need what, uh, 1,120 uh, crores to put up, uh, no, 1,200 crores, in fact. At one go, you have to spend 1,200 crores. 
so you need 1200 crores immediately but this money would not come you know immediately so what i would do is okay we'll have a strong medical insurance scheme slowly start putting this line acts then there is a meeting point between them where you are fully self sufficient so you have a financial model developed so you need to convince the the bureaucracy in a couple of meetings you then and then go to the political executive okay this is the strategy which you get and mostly it is accepted so that is the 95% part which i was talking about all right makes makes a lot of sense so there's this i think especially in the modern day age there's a saying that uh, i think mark andreessen and peter thiel they say about this a lot that your job should never be your identity the job has various other components to it there are many armed forces officers who represent india in the olympics or asian games there are many ips officers who are climbing himalayas there are ifs officers who are writing books because for roop's name come to my mind as of now so in the ias do you get the time to pursue other hobbies other passions and yes, how supportive and how supportive yes. is the government yes, yes, yes. i have a very close friend who is my batchmate who is collector noida dm noida who is a para olympian how do you think he is a para olympian so there are officers in fact i think there is a guy my junior i think ravinder i believe he scaled himalayas also and he wrote a book so there are that's all a narrative we see what we want to see just because we don't see what what is there it doesn't mean that what we saw is the only thing which is the truth so it's the simple narrative problem it's not there are officers who have written book i think i always think that uh, you talked about it i think the richness of experience which we have i don't think any other service would have that the kind of things which you i think we can write book after if you ask me i would uh, in fact write one book on my own andhra experience so the time i think time is a constraint so i think uh, there are officers who are beautiful writers who would pick and write and the, i think you and you as an ias officer you need to be always writing because you are writing file notes all those things so you are good in writing so it's a natural and foreign service officers also write a lot because of their own diplomacy notes which they prepare every single time so you are basically a writer so i think there are a couple of books which are published so it is coming i think i think one of the reasons we are not able to do much of this is that we don't have that much of free time so i would bring this point right when you look at a job of an ias officer i you is completely filled for 20 25 years of your job doing this or that you actually do not have free time in fact i remember one one said a I won't call it a shunt posting, but I would call it a lean time posting. So I went and told my boss, sir, please do not shift me from this thing. For the first time in ten years, I got this job, so I need to be there for two months, three months. So you are doing n number of things all the time. All right. Thank you so much, Naveen. That that's very helpful. But um, so how supportive is the government uh, in in ensuring that the civil servants they also get the time to pursue their hobbies? Oh, it's not support. You have to make your way. Okay, because I was reading. Uh, I think yesterday if they were. If you yeah. if you are a good worker, you'll get more good work. So how do you do it? <laughs> yeah, I mean you have to make your way. So I think uh, it's it's the you, we talk about uh, work balance. I think I remember a beautiful picture. It's not like a a other work balance, other work balance. It is a lot of dots inside a continuum. I think I am not able to whether you can the imagine the picture I am trying to show. It's not like. 40% balance or 30 percent balance it's like you have a long continuum which is blue then you have 30 uh, red spots where you are you have your balance it's not a, uh, i i think i love this image i think when i uh, maybe send it to you so that's the how work balance looks like it's not just a x c so i would say yeah, yeah. it's like it's a different <laughs> game so you need to make your way out of it there are i know an officer who is publishing writing every single day so you need to make that one hour five i read i read every single day i love reading so every single day i, I put one hour read i have a digital detox time also sir digital detox not when i'm sleeping the digital detox is when i'm actively involved i'll keep my phone away for an hour or two so these are things which i picked up so there are things which you can actually pick up you know, it's not just that you are forced to do many things and you yeah. need you, can, you cannot do digital detox all the time also sometimes you are in a very busy post you can't think i will not today i will do it so there is some sort of intelligent compromise you need to do absolutely it makes a lot of sense and uh, let's talk about the the current posting that you have uh, what is what what's the work that you're doing currently and uh, what are the challenges that you're facing in doing your daily tasks see i i'm a special secretary here so when i was given this charge somewhere in october of last year Uh, the task was to computerize all the government hospitals 
which means that you are talking to doctors, you are talking to lab technicians, you are talking to nurses who have to be trained, capacity building. And you always, these the, the systems have been there for, that's also the legacy. I think legacy, the word I'm using this word legacy. The systems have been there before uh, I was born, right? The way it was. So how do you go and change them? So the nudges want something. So we invented a way. So how do you encourage doctors to, you know, make more, you know, entries into the EHR system? So, so you, so I picked up one small component and make them. So they love this appreciation, right? So we made them, okay, the best doctor or best this thing, best hospital, something. We started doing this appreciation. We talked about the incentive. So we incentivized by appreciating them. And suddenly you see they are they become the leaders to you know bring this change. So I, I think as an administrator, you need to you know find solutions for the challenge, not just crib about it. I tell a doctor he doesn't do it, then I come back cribbing, okay, sir, oh nahi kar ra, that won't work, right? So it, I have to find a way to make him work. So we what I I have this data entry operator who makes about 20 uh, 260 entries a day. And uh, so there are people who work. Uh, so you I even yeah, our, when we were doing this award ceremony, we even brought this data entry operators who are sitting in the entrance of the hospital registration, making your data entry to give you that OP sheet, the uh, operation sheet. So we gave awards to them also. So it is the, you need to understand what is the ecosystem and, you know, change it. So this, that is the reason Andhra is the leader in digital healthcare. Today, in fact, if you have seen my last post, we have put scan and share where a patient doesn't have to stand in a queue. You just have to take that, this mobile phone app and, you know, click that QR code, this token is automatically printed. And these particulars are there in the system or her particulars are there in the system. So that's how it works. Challenges will always be there. I think it's not just for me, it's for even a medical superintendent of an hospital will have a challenge. He has to handle 20, 41 departments in the medical college. So he has to be a strong administrator. And you know, you need to deal it. I think on a daily basis, we have challenges. That's how the world is, I think. It's not that you have you get up in the morning, everything is in place, and then you start rolling out. It's not the way it is. You need challenges are there. You find solutions for them. Absolutely, I think uh, very well said. I think the posting that you're currently holding is of extreme relevance, more so in the day and age that we live in, where health is not just about the physical aspects of it. There's also a good component of mental health. Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, he said that uh, when he's investing in companies. He invests in companies where, which are in some way or the other promulgating the seven deadly sins. And look at all the consumer good companies today. Netflix is sloth, Twitter is wrath, LinkedIn is in a way becoming pride, Net and Instagram is envy, so on and so forth. And because of this, uh, because of the user engagement, because of many aspects associated with it, we are seeing a mental health loneliness crisis going on in, in the world today. China is uh, in a way reacting to it by putting some sort of ban on these apps and ensuring that TikTok, let's say, is not used that often. They have a separate UI UX for TikTok in China versus the rest of the world. What are your thoughts on this? And how can India look at this aspect where these all consumer companies are in a way promulgating the, the deadly sense? And India is a country where we have 800 million people with internet access. It's a demographic dividend that we talk about, but soon it can turn into a disaster if the aspect of mental well-being is not taken into consideration. Okay, two, three points which I wanted to make is one is uh, when you are young, right? When they tell you health is well, then it looks like a very funny story because you are healthy, healthy. <laughs> so, but I think the, what COVID has learned is that, uh, taught us not learned, what we learned during the COVID is that health is wealth. I think you can be super rich, super tempting. And given the post-COVID complications, it's not just of mental health. The, the ways the, the virus has affected us, it's, it's a long journey from here. So I think we need to say, take health as a serious concern. Talking about the uh, the misuse or the, uh, yeah, you as I read somewhere, when was the last time you were bored? So when I'm waiting somewhere, I don't have to do anything. I just have to open my Instagram, LinkedIn or something, you spend time. So the concept of boredom is lost. I think that's something I think the younger generation would not even know. There is something called bored because you have something in your hand to, you know, pass time, right? So that's also there. But this is the same question you asked me also came up when the internet came to this country or to the world. Will the internet will take away uh, the, it will make us more mentally ill or something. But 20 years, I think uh, internet came somewhere in 1996 or 1995 to the country. So I'm, I have survived at least 25 years or so. So we, I don't think there are, there is, I think this, this, 
I I do not know how to explain this question, but it's this uh, consciousness. I think there's a certain consciousness which will, uh, you know, come around and then suddenly. In in fact, I remember I was somewhere in 2008 or 9. I was addicted to Farmville. There's a game on Facebook, Farmville. So every single day I'll come and play, and then I realize that after a point, I made a new resolution. I'll not play it. I I talked about digital detox. So I think. we need to educate people on it i think that's something which we are trying to do to the you know the as an uh, state government uh, we are bringing this uh, program called emotional assessment for student educators and i completely agree with you on this mental health is the next big thing it's a silent killer their effects of having a strong mental health program would not come these are not measurable when you are talk to measurable how do i measure the national mental health right it's as good as, as good as Uh, talking about the happiness index, but how do you measure it? These are the numbers who are not going to. These are the numbers which can't be measured. People don't talk about mental health problems. First of all, there is no awareness on it. I think we need to build a strong, uh, you know, ecosystem. I think, uh, you know, stopping or banning is not the only way. If it, this is not there, they will find something else to do it. Right? Books. I think some people are addicted to books also. That people used to think why driving. So there are things which. so i think we should not i think that old age old age wisdom of anything in excess is bad so i think that's the something which we need to teach people or you know that's something which i think my father was very particular but i think one of the biggest lessons is uh, which i i think he was always inspirational in this one he would give this all this axioms or idioms which would help so we should always have what we need not more than greedy is one thing which will not or over doing or in excess i think our own society is built on that i think we need to find roots in our own societal values i think that will help us in you know being a better mental state or a country or a society absolutely but the good thing about books is that uh, those are not algorithm driven but uh, we can't say the same for instagram and tiktok that are yeah. algorithm driven and and the only metric that uh, the product managers care about is the engagement rate and the click through rate so on and so forth and this in a way sort of plays with your brain and uh, engages people in doing things that they may not otherwise do but i uh, posted put a post yesterday saying in the twitter office of shadow i was like at least some good has happened now <laughs> so it's a joke so what it's You yeah I, I do not know I do not know there's this mo- mo- beautiful movie called Circle right mm-hmm. so yeah and I think we have to find a way out absolutely so uh, Navin you looked you seem like a very well read person and uh, along with the job you also read through many books if you were to recommend five books from your book list for the audiences between the age group of twenty to thirty if they should read that can change their perspectives in life. what would those five books be first book i think first book is definitely the best book i think i keep i think this is a book which i gift the most one is uh, atomic habits i think it's i till date i follow i i think it's the most beautifully written book atomic habits second i think now uh, the almanac of uh, naval ravikant i think this is a book i i don't know how i missed it but i think i picked it a couple of months back beautifully written book i think sometimes this was a book as if i was talking to myself i there are there are books which talks to yourself right this was one and there was one written by dr b s ajay kumar so these are two books which gave me that feeling third is this beautifully written book i think the only book i even read glossary also uh, 40 rules of love it's an i think she is a turkish uh, i forgot her name she also was nominated for the booker last year right something and fifth a fourth yeah i had to tell the fourth book it's the i like this book called measure what matters i think it also happens to be bill gates favorite book so uh, i'm i'm giving you all non fiction right i not a fiction reader so measure what matters i think uh, it talks about uh, the google play book i think this guy mentored the google uh, guys this is also another favorite book of mine which i give people and you should also read a book on aging i i'm, I'm not able to recollect the name of the book Uh, that's something gives you how you go through your health and all. Uh, in fact, how you I forgot the book's name. I think uh, I had gifted somebody also. So these are the five books I would recommend. I think if you want me the sixth book, I'll think of uh, principles. I think that's also a nice book. Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio. So I think he uh, he also writes well. 
I think uh, when I read that book, it was the 50th book. I, I met a point in somewhere in 19, I should read 50 books. Mm-hmm. So this was the 50th book I read. So read, read that, you know, so I, the way I read is I read economics, history. My reading is more Zen. So like the way you talked about algorithms, so one book takes me to the other book. So it's not, so I have an algorithm for books. So it's not, I pick this book. So I read about a couple of books quoted in that particular book. So I pick that, those books. So it goes on like that for me. So it's, that's the algorithm for me, for my books. So I, but I, I have a classical, I have a very strong thing goes, if I read history book, the next book should be some other sort of topic. Because you have to, you know, keep, there are people only will be reading self help tips, right? It won't help. You need to read business, you need to read economics, you need to... then you have that all facets of your own memory or your brain or intelligence would grow. It's not just you read particular kind of books, it will help. So I think I strongly advise that we should pick different kinds of book. I I I think once if you are doing ten books in a year, you should pick at least two books in economics, two books in business management. Learn a skill all the time. So I think that helps. Uh, learning a skill is always the best thing you'll do. In fact, yesterday I was asking my chartered accountant, there was a DCG course. So mm-hmm. I asked him, did you do this course? He said, yes, I did it. So how many hours would it take? So he says, two hours, sir. So okay, let me do it. I used to do a lot of online courses. Now I stopped doing it. I think last couple of years, I'm not able to do it because of the time constraints, but I'll pick it. These are habits which I have strongly put inside me, so I'll pick. That's, that's truly remarkable and inspiring to some, to some extent that you still upskill yourself uh, and along with such a meticulous job that you're doing. So one last question, uh, Naveen, what would be your vision of vision or dream of an ideal India in 2050? What would be those facets of an ideal India for you? See, country is, I think it's a beautiful country. Okay? I, I cannot imagine myself living in any, any other country. I think I'm blessed for whatever you call it. The diversity, I think we should, we are the most beautiful country in terms of diversity, the kinds of things which we have. And I also see that country would be a very strong leader. Uh, I, I definitely see it. I, when I, I think one of the comments which I made is we are definitely progressing to that end. I think this is the only country in the, uh, in uh, given a couple of countries in the world, which has always been on the progressive, you know, route in the last 60, 70 years. Uh, it's, you can't say that it's, it, there are issues, I think we'll point out a number of issues which are there. But again, I use that 95% logic. Why do we get distracted with the 5% thing, but we should also look at the 95% thing which you are doing right, right? So we should look at that point of view. I think it's a, it'll be a country to live in. I think a lot of people are already talking about it's the century for the country. It's the India century, which is coming. So I think that's the closing words I want. It's the country's India century at 2050. Okay. So when you are, uh, you know, preparing for the civil service, you have to read so many things, right? Where you will wonder why you are reading so many things, and then uh, what is the use of it? You know, the which side what is coming or not. But when you are in a job like this, when you are actually in a job like this, you will understand the power of memory and recall. You can't simply talk in a go to a meeting and say, "Sir, I'll see the file and tell you." Hmm. You need to remember, have your facts on, you know, fingertips. I have a boss right now who knows, like, comes completely prepared. He doesn't see sheets because what you know, when you are asked a question, anything can come from anywhere. So everything's under the sun. So it makes a lot of sense for civil servants to be very strongly with strong memory power and recall, strong memory power and recall. So I think it makes a very strong, uh, you become a good bureaucrat. It's I think one of the rule books we have talked about, uh, essential qualities of a civil servant is strong memory power. When you're preparing for services, you will not know why it is used, but you actually, when you're sitting there, you know that it is, that's a very big value. And I think you can develop that strong memory only when you're interlink things. You're interlink philosophy with psychology to economics because your power to remember things increases and enhances. And that's perhaps the reason why you... Yeah, yeah, the most important part is recall. See, how, there are people who prepare for these exams, they will not qualify. So I keep telling them, you need to you know, do the testing part. Revising, testing. So when you do that test and writing and all, then you improve the power of recall. It's like a system, right? You put something, you have to recall it. That's when it will work better. It's, uh, you sh- uh, that's why I also read about brain, how it works. So my auntie was telling me that you should use left hand more. So she'll learn something to use the left hand. So sh- it will keep you agile. Because we tend so to are, use you, right are hand you ambidextrous now? No, no, I'm a okay. right hand person. But I'm trying to use... So in fact, I picked up this new habit of brushing my uh, teeth with my left hand. Mm-hmm. 
it helps yeah makes makes a lot of sense and also i think uh, you just to elaborate briefly on the comment of trolls um uh, usually when you end up doing really good things in life trolling happens because it's very easy to criticize and very difficult to create so when you are in civil services you will be taking decisions that may be controversial and there will be a segment of people who will be up in arms against you for no reason and if you look into them you would realize that they haven't created themselves anything it's very easy to criticize things so don't so worry about it most of the civil yeah. servants would try to be low profile because they want to do their in a part without uh, lying it so that is one thing which is taught every strongly in the civil services keep low profile do your thing come out i think i think i i'm also kind of believer in it so off late but i think off late i think uh, off late which i learned is you are your own brand also you need to talk about what you are doing it's for the betterment of the services only in fact the narrative which i am trying to put is you need to know the faces of the civil servants also yeah. they are the they are the same uh, thing which you think so i think it's in a positive way it's good also the people are coming and talking about what they are doing so it's if better india is not there we would not know many civil servants are doing excellent work on the field it's all untold story unpublished story but in the long run it helps you these are all localized story i would not know that this particular lady went on you know changing the way the lakes in hyderabad would look like mm-hmm. so there are stories there are n number of stories which we do not know uh, there are officers who have done natural farming or engaged natural farming things like that so these stories are published for their own good for the good of the country it's just the changing the narratives yeah i think anil swaru the former secretary of education he also started something called nexus nexus for good nexus for good yeah yeah so i think uh, that's another One another of the initiatives yes yeah and what what are your thoughts on the civil servants who are now running full fledged youtube channels and carry the camera wherever they go what yeah it's as good as <laughs> So I'm a somewhere in between that continuum. So I can't make a comment. I'm not that extreme. Also, not this extreme. Also, so I I think there has to be a balance. The way we talk about work-life balance, there has to be a balance of what you do and publish. It's not just collecting uh, followers. It's just about showing the sorry. So I have a very strong policy. And if you look at my LinkedIn, I only talk about my work. Yeah. It's not about acquiring uh, followers. I don't post story to acquire followers. So I talk about my work to tell the good stories which we do. So exactly. That's the only strategy. People tell me. I uh, day before one of my friend told me post this story you will get more followers I would not I would only want to tell my story which is the work which we do or maybe I have not posted any forwards in fact I have I have a temptation to post a lot of atomic habits of course I love him in fact Adam Grant quotes but there was this Adam Grant quote he talked about resilience in fact Adam Grant is also one instagramer I follow very strictly This guy is awesome, but I think I'm looking for his. His best book has not come yet. That's what my personal feeling. That's why I didn't recommend his book in the mm-hmm. five book list. But I keep following him every single day. He writes really well. His best book has not come, so we'll wait for it. <laughs> I agree. And um, thinking of Adam Grant as an Instagrammer was was very interesting because I always had this thing in mind that uh, he is a great professor at Boston. But uh, yeah. totally concur with your views on adam grant and hope uh, hyman uh, dr hyman is also one guy who i'm following uh, dr ibn should they were very so he has written up okay, there's a nice book i think i should you should include it what the food i think that's a book which everyone should read food is medicine so we should i think i would include that book in my book of five what the food yeah sounds you have a very broad list and also i'm curious about about the work that you did with akhilesh yadav I was in his yeah. uh, CM office. Mm-hmm. I was the youngest member in his CM office. And this was before the IAS or the after after civil services? Oh, it was as an IAS officer. Okay. I was special secretary to CM. One of my resume will say that I'm special secretary to CM. I was uh, there for three years with him. And what's the usual work profile of a special secretary to the CM? See, you would be uh, you are the uh, see a CM office is more of an uh, you know CM office only. It's a political office where you need to. what i was talking about connecting government to the public so you are also doing public darshan solving problems you are uh, managing files i was managing about five departments transport law things like that so uh, you are you are the connect between the chief minister and the government and the issues was so you i think up had 93 departments so we were seven officers six or seven officers who were handling all this 93 so many files coming for his permissions and uh, approval so 
He was sitting down. It's a huge uh, missionary which was there. And they also get to travel with him and uh, look at uh, the um, way the the it is presented, things like that. So the, every CM office is like that. Even the present CM office is also tough. And uh, it also, uh, I think there are people who talk about a strong CM office also because these are the ways who gets work done, right? So yeah, it's important that you. I I think I was there. I was just six years into service when I was six or seven years into service. I was there from 14 to 17. So just six or seven years into service. So what are the misconceptions that people have about politicians? Yeah, I think there's a lot of misconception. In fact, I wrote this thing, right? We think we are the only ones who know stuff. Whenever I attend the present chief minister here also, I get goosebumps. These guys have a strong uh, visionary because they have grounded uh, knowledge. Uh, they have superlative knowledge in Yanka. So they have very strong rounded knowledge. They know what will work, what will not work, small, small things. Mm-hmm. And it's not an easy game to become a politician, be a leader. Uh, yesterday also I was talking to one of my friends. What is that they have people come and politics? It's not just hero worship. It's not just hero worship. It's not just you have uh, you are a, a leader because there are hundreds of leaders in your own community. There are hundreds of people who have ideologies. You are you are outshining each one of them. What makes you outshine? You talked about Lalu Prasad Yadav. Why is he worshipped? Or you talk about Mulayam Singh Yadav You talk about Mayavati Madam. You talk about the present. There are hundreds of people with the same quality. So what is that they have that... So nobody has cracked this leadership. In fact, I am still not able to crack it. So they have something in them which is strongly rooted in values or something. It's not just you see a good face, you put... Or else every cinema politician would become a... This one, right? Chief Minister. They have more followers or any Instagram and there are people who have uh, 20 million Instagram followers. They would have become a prime president or a prime minister. So there is something which is there. I, I am not, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm sounding naive, but mm-hmm. the reason I'm sounding naive is I am not able to tell you. It's not just the charismatic personality or the authority or the caste or the uh, ideology, which is driving the emergence of this big leadership, but it is, it is something they have maybe more of an, uh, a strong will, uh, determination to do good things. That is something which we do not see all the time. So that is the thing which attracts people more than what we think. We have this naive, uh, I think we are naive in a way, but because of our you know, upbringing and training and uh, the way we are made to think, we do not see those facets of uh, leaderships. Yeah. And I'm also seeing this trend where various civil servants, they are resigning from their jobs to participate in political elections. Uh, the name Uthra that comes to mind. Hai, but yes, sir, there is one guy who was the state BJP president now. Okay, she okay. always wanted to become, I heard that he always wanted to be a politician. So that, that is there from the, like the way I myself I wanted to always become an IAS officer. There are people who always wanted to become politicians. Sir. It's just that means to that end. So some think that way. So it's not just it's not just that uh, they resigned to become politician. Maybe they had it in their back of the mind before they started becoming a civil servant. But we do not know. But it. one we thing is clear: many civil servants who are becoming politicians are doing incredible work, and uh, could so be because so always asked to me, so I always escape the system. <laughs> yeah, but. Um... So, I mean, I have my biases. Why is that happening? Because they have already worked at implementation stage. They've worked at some segment in the policy stage, formulation stage, and now they are given the charge of, and they've managed politicians in, in back in their career. And now because when they're, they're acquiring power mm-hmm. uh, at the political front, they're able to bring forth large scale changes. Yeah, Head um, Start is there. Sorry? Head Start is there. Yeah. So is, is, is that reasoning correct? Is this why... Yeah, so, yeah. Because if you see, I think uh, that is a natural head start you have, right? If tomorrow I'm made a minister of uh, health and family, if I'll be able to run it properly or maybe an MLA or MP, I would know what is the issue. So that is there. But I would also think what is the, you should also look at this question. What is that motivation which is keeping them in service, not letting them present? This is a question which we never ask. We always ask that other way, the mm-hmm. question the other way. What is that motivation for this civil servants to stay in the system and not present it? So you think of that. That will give you better answer. Yeah. So what is motivation? I have no idea. We are all thinking. I love this introspection. I love doing introspection. I keep thinking. I think that's what makes evolves as what we are. We need to introspect and find answers. Not just have ready-made answers. I might have an answer today. My, tomorrow my answer would change. That's what we are. 
yeah this is truly insightful navin i am going to be in india until january so if you're in delhi let us let me know and would love to catch up and sure. uh, if you plan you're on you're still in india i am in india for a couple of months i'm no oh, i didn't know that yeah <laughs> I, i got back uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, i was in delhi day before i got uh, <laughs> nausea and headache because i was in delhi because this weather is so clean and suddenly i landed up in delhi and i did not know why i am having a headache from morning i kept on walking thinking there is no blood flow then one lady who is head of metronic she tells me no navin it's because of pollution the moment she said pollution i could actually feel it now and it was pollution which made me sick uh, i hope you're doing well i hope doing well now yeah i'm good now yeah one day's rest helped me yeah we will be so we doing certain some events for global governance initiative in bangalore delhi calcutta Uh, and also in mumbai so i should be in delhi next week and uh, would love to catch up yeah definitely thanks come on thank you so much navin we can Once do again. all this inside talks on the over a coffee would love to yeah, yeah. um not all a big fan of well, the stories you want to hear <laughs> not not a big fan of delhi coffee but definitely filter coffee no no oh, uh, delhi mein na blue tokai acha hai I love it. I I went all the way to Kutub Minar once to have that blue tobacco coffee. It's a South Indian coffee, but it's very nice. Now they have opened a lot of outlets. Let's let's do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Naman. Wow. And any last words for the viewers? Last words: Be proud. Do things for the country. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, thank you so much, Naveen. Absolutely loved your approach in life and uh, and how you mitigate the negativity around you. loved your book list will follow through on on that on that list as well i think i've read quite a few already and uh, once again thank you so much for taking out the time always a pleasure to chat with you and always learn a new things from from you thank you naman thank you for taking your time thank you so much all the very best take care naveen and have a wonderful weekend thank you so much